Well, I'm just uh, finishing up trimming on the very last plank, AKA the whiskey plank. And we're gonna get this on the boat today. And in addition to that, we're gonna answer some viewer questions. So stick around, that's all coming up on the Art of Boat Building. I thought this would be a good opportunity to run through the basic planking process for each plank. It all begins with a spiling batten. And as you remember, a spiling batten is taking the shape of the plank uh, with some dividers. We then get some planking stock and lay it out and get it cut to the length and to determine where it needs to be scarfed at. And after that is done, we can then run it through the planer and clean up one side. Because of the one inch thickness of the material that I have, I resawed it down to the proper thickness of each plank. After that's done, I ran it through the planer one more time to get a nice smooth surface on both sides. And after we have our planking stock prepared, we can then cut those scarf joints where they need to be. I then epoxy them together and let them sit overnight. Then in the morning, I'd come in and I would lay out that spiling batten on there and to determine the shape of the plank. Once that's done, you can then cut it out. I generally cut it out so that I leave a little bit of pencil line showing. And after that's done, I then take it over to my bench and do a process called slip boarding. And that's a matter of laying your plane on its side so that you get a nice 90 degree angle cleaned up on that plank. Once we have that shape all cleaned up, we can then go to the boat and measure the bevels and record them. After we've recorded the bevels, we can then go to the plank and cut that bevel at each station. We are then prepared to cut the rolling bevel with a simple hand plane and connecting those slots together. In this example, all I need to do is look for that raft area, and as I'm planing it down, slowly watching it disappear and cut down to where it's at the same bevel. Then if the plank needs backing out, which is a process of hollowing up the inside of the plank so that it'll lay nicely on the frames, it can be done at this time. Some planks simply don't need it because the frame is straight enough. Once all that's done, you're ready to offer the plank up to the boat and see how it fits. Generally, the first fitting, there needs to be just a little bit of trimming and adjusting. So that's it. That's sort of the basic outline of preparing a plank for the boat. Now, if you want to know more in depth about each one of those things, you can check that out in this playlist on Carvel Planking. Hey, Bob. I want to congratulate you on reaching the whiskey plank. and. Just want to know a little bit more about this piece of artwork behind me. It's a beautiful sculpture you made at one point. Take care, Bob. Good luck on the rest of it. Well, thanks, Jim. That sculpture is entitled Sistine Touch, and it's part of the permanent collection of the Elmhurst Art Museum. And it's located just outside of the south entrance to the museum. You can certainly see the inspiration of sailboats in this particular piece of sculpture. Hi Bob, I just wanted to congratulate you on your whiskey plank. Very well done. And um, cheers. Dink. <laughs> Pickett asks me, first of all, I consider your boats a work of art. Well, thanks Sam, I really appreciate that. Outside of boats, are you working on any art projects at the current time? And yes, I am. Uh, the city of Morton, which is a small community about a half an hour from here, a uh, patron um, purchased a piece of my sculpture to be put in their town square. Uh, that should be going in in the next week or so. So perhaps I'll shoot a little video and include that in the next episode. Congratulations, Bob. Can't wait to see it in the water. Peter Nash from the Mediterranean asks about how I keep my shop organized and cleaned up. And in his case, he said that in his shop, he gets involved in a project, and then it looks like IED went off, and then he spends a couple of days cleaning it up. 
what I've learned over my years is I used to do that, and now I clean up pretty much after every task and put the tools away, even if I think I'm going to get the tool right back out again. Uh, I've found that it's the same amount of time either way, and I really enjoy uh, having a clean workspace, and quite honestly, it's a little bit safer, and it's a real joy to come in in the morning and have everything put away and ready to work. So thanks for your question, Peter. Hearty congratulations and cheers to you and your beautiful boat, Bob. Here's to you and your whiskey plank. Tom Truesdale asks, my question would be, have you picked out a color for her yet? Your model shows white over green. Are you going to stay with that? And I'm not sure if I will or not. Uh, those just happened to be the paints that I had laying around the studio at the time that I painted it. Last summer, I was out at the um, Mystic Seaport Museum and I saw Hershoff boat Aralon. And I really liked the color combination of it. So that probably a stronger contender at this moment. Um, but we'll see. Thanks for your question, Tom. Phil Simmons writes, I love the quality and care you put into your work. The boat is looking lovely. Would you recommend this design as a first film? Well, to be honest, Phil, no, I would not. As my friend Tom Brattle from the Tidewater Workshop puts it, this is a graduate level boat build. I would recommend starting with something a little bit smaller so that it could be accomplished quicker and also perhaps something that came in a kit form. The great thing about those is they come along with a book of instructions, unlike a boat like this one. Uh, this boat that you see over my shoulder is actually one of the first boats that I built, and it was a Chesapeake light craft kit. Um, I think it's a really a great way to get started. Thanks for your question and your comments, Phil. Everyone here at Tidewater Wooden Boat Workshop sends their congratulations on you finishing the planking on your beautiful boat. We can't wait till you finish her all the way, and we wish we could be there now to celebrate this Whiskey Plank Day, but we're having one here for you and sending our congratulations. Lori writes, our whole family enjoys watching your channel together. Well, that's great to hear, Lori. Uh, I'm really glad that it's appealing to all ages. Her question is, if I may, how old are you? Well, I'm 65 years old. Do you have a family, children, spouse? Well, 42 years ago, I was lucky enough to marry my college sweetheart, Dina. Hi, honey. Congratulations on this milestone. You've been working really hard. I can't wait to have our first sale. Cheers. Well, I have two children, a son, Ian, who is married to Sophia. Hey, Dad, congrats on finishing the boat. Can't wait to go sailing with you. And a daughter, Lindy, who is married to Chad. Congrats on the whiskey plank. You're one step closer to being done. Yay. Can't wait to take a ride. And they have two children, and I have two amazing grandchildren. Clyde Cessna asks a four-part question. The first part was, does anyone know who Joel White was? Well, yes, a lot of people know who Joel White was. In fact, here's a book that I have about his life and uh, essays about some of the significant boats that he designed. So Joel White was a boat builder, a designer, and a sailor, and he is the founder of the Brooklyn Boat Yard uh, in 1960. Uh, his son, Steve, is currently in charge of that. The second question that he asks, um, what are his dates? Well, Joel White was born in 1930, and he died in 1997. And I believe he designed the Haven in 1985. The next part is, does anybody know if he knew the hair shops? Well, since uh, Joel White was born in 1930 and Nathaniel Herrenshoff died in 1938, my guess is that they had never met. 
And what inspired him to modify the original 12 and a half? Well, in this book, it talks about how Joel White owned a Harishoff 12 and a half uh, that was named Shadow. And he found that it was such a wonderful sailor that then he set out to not change the characteristics of the boat by changing it into a center board as opposed to a full keel, and which, which he accomplished it very well. Uh, all of the wetting surfaces of both boats are exactly the same. And in fact, in regattas, uh, they're actually equally uh, measured. There is no handicap for one to the other. Thanks for your question, Clyde. I would invite you to watch uh, season two, episode one, which goes more in depth about Joel White and why he built the Haven. Hi, Bob. From one Haven builder to another, congratulations on your shutter plank. Whiskey plank, as they might call it. Gregory from Queensland, Australia writes, I love your tool videos. Will you be making more in the future? And if so, what might they be? Well, Gregory, I really enjoy making these tool videos. And as many of you may have guessed, the tools that I'm making are the ones that basically are shipwright tools. And I'm making them as I need them. So some of the tools that will be coming up in the future will be a caulking roller, a caulking mallet, a draw knife, rigger's knife, a compass plane, spoke shave, a timber slick, a gents saw, and maybe a sextant. So stay tuned, got lots of tools to build. Thanks for your question, Gregory. James writes, I love your videos and the way you quietly teach about boat building. Thanks, James. I've heard the term edge setting in reference to planking. What is edge setting? When planks are on a boat, sometimes they need to be trimmed or tweaked a little bit. And this sometimes is accomplished by a process that's called edge setting. And this simply means that it's squeezing the planks together where they're, when they're put on the boat. Book boats uh, can only be edge set so much, but with a boat like mine, little planks that are more flexible, especially cedar, uh, they can be easily pulled into place. In planking the boat, I started on the starboard side and then moved to the port and then the starboard, and then the port, and so on and so on, until I got down to the shear. At the shear strake, I cut out both planks at the same time, and then I put the port side plank on first, breaking from my tradition, simply so that I would have a little bit more room on the starboard side to videotape the process of getting the whiskey plank on. Congratulations on the whiskey plank, Bob. Cheers. Cheers. Well, the time has finally come. It's time to offer up this plank and get it installed. All right. One of the things that I do with all of the planks is I start with station 10 and I have a mark here and line it up. And I use station 10 because it's the first four station of the center board and then it's just easy for me to identify it. So we'll get some clamps on here.
along pretty good. These cam clamps really work good for this. It's good. In fastening the planks on here, I like to start at the stem. That way, as I work backwards, um, if the plank needs to shift a little bit, it can run wild off of the transom. I use this uh, sealant on both the stem and the transom it's for a little security and <clears throat> works really well. One of the many benefits of having rib bands on there is that I can use that as a clamping surface to pull that bottom or actually the top of the plank in flush with the ribs. One of the other benefit of the rib bands is it gives you some place to put your strap on. this old Kevlar strap underneath here just to protect the cedar because it's really soft. had some questions about this screwdriver and it is a Stanley Yankee I believe it's um, 130 model 130a it's uh, extremely handy for doing this I 
had one from a long time ago that had been my grandfather's and it disappeared somewhere and I actually got this one off of eBay. sealant on here. Last screw. Done. Thanks everybody for coming along on my boat building journey. Cheers.